In this video, we finally want to have a little glimpse on what has become one of the most powerful AD conversion techniques, the Delta Sigma Converter. This is a large topic and we will only scratch the surface of it, but it's worth to understand the principles as these converters deliver top-notch performance in resolution and accuracy. Some of these converters can achieve incredibly high resolutions of 24 bits at sampling rates of 96 kilo samples per second. Others are designed for relatively high speeds of about 20 mega samples per second at a still remarkable 16-bit resolution. This makes them the best choice for audio applications and high precision measurement equipment. In our previous video, we talked about the idea of a charged balance ADC, which takes a digital output signal, subtracts it from the input signal and integrates the difference. The average value of the output signal will take on the value of the input signal and the difference approaches zero. At the same time, the digitized output signal is proportional to the input signal. Now let's take this circuit and look at it from a different angle. The comparator in this circuit, combined with the D flip-flop, is basically a 1-bit analog-to-digital converter, which converts its input signal into a bit stream. Its sampling rate is dependent on the clock signal, which is applied to the D flip-flop. The following switch, which is triggered by the D flip-flop, can be considered as a 1-bit digital-to-analog converter or DAC, because it converts the digital signal from the output of the D flip-flop into a voltage that is either VREF or zero. The most interesting thing, however, is the first stage of this circuit, which we have called integrator for the sake of simplicity. It actually has two purposes. First, the output signal is subtracted from the input signal, which can be regarded as differentiation, mathematically called delta. The second purpose, the integration, is basically a summation, which is referred to as sigma in mathematics, hence delta-sigma converter. In practice, VREF is often replaced by either a precision current source or a digital-to-analog converter that switches between two voltages, for example, 1 and minus 1 volts. To better understand this circuit, we can also simplify it by eliminating the output counter and splitting the differential amplifier and integrator. In this representation, we get a first-order delta-sigma modulator. Since this basic structure is widespread, it will serve as the basis for our explanation. The modulator is the heart of the Delta Sigma converter, in which the magic takes place. On the internet, there is often no agreement in forums about whether the designation Delta Sigma or Sigma Delta converter is correct for these ADCs. The discussion revolves around whether the difference of a sum or the sum of differences is formed here. We don't really care about such rather religious questions, which is why we used the more common term Delta Sigma ADC. Now that we've got that sorted out, let's focus on how they work. In order to fully understand the Delta Sigma process, we want to consider a simple example. Let's assume that an engineer buys a cup of coffee every morning to get a dose of caffeine so he can survive the day. In a nearby coffee house, one cup of coffee costs 3 euros and 47 cents. The old-fashioned cafe does not accept credit cards and has a constant lack of change. The resourceful engineer nevertheless finds an agreement that allows him to pay with a 5 euro bill without under or overpaying the cafe. He simply takes the advantage of the fact that he visits the cafe every day. The agreement between the two parties is as follows. Every day, 
if the engineer owes the cafe more than 250, he gives the shop assistant a 5 euro bill. If he owes less than 250 instead, he pays nothing. The engineer also keeps track of how much he owes the cafe. The transactions for the first three days are shown here. On the first day, the engineer pays 5 euros as agreed. He notes at the end of the day that he owes the cafe minus 1.53 euros. The minus sign simply indicates that the engineer paid too much. When ordering at the cafe on the second day, the engineer reminds the shop assistants of the overpayment the day before. So he now only has to pay 3.47 minus 1.53 is 1.94 euros. This is below 2 euros and 50 cents. And as agreed, he pays nothing and notes again that he owes the cafe 1.94 euros. The calculation goes on as shown. On the third day, the engineer has to pay 5.41 euros. And as per the understanding with the shop assistant, he hands over a 5 euro bill. He notes that he still owes the cafe 0.41 euros. This continues every day endlessly. What is actually happening can be seen in this diagram. In the figure x represents the price of the coffee, u the money the engineer is giving, which is either 0 or 5 euros, y is the average value the engineer pays for the coffee day by day, and n the number of days that have passed. You can see that over time the value of y approaches that of x. Still, it might seem a little surprising that the engineer would be able to pay an inconvenient sum of 3.47 euros with only 5 euro bills. The delta sigma way exploits the fact that the price x remains the same from day to day. It also uses feedback to approximate y to x over time. Each single 5 euros or 0 euros denoted as u has no meaning. One can determine y and therefore x from u only by averaging many samples. The entire process can also be depicted in the flowchart where the price x is the input of the circuit, u is the occasional 5 euro bill and y is the average value the engineer has to pay for the coffee each individual day. Or if we transfer the thought to an electronic circuit, x is the input voltage V in, y the output value D out of a 1 bit ADC, and u is the output value of a digital to analog converter, which is either 0 or VREF. This traditional structure used to represent the functionality of a delta sigma ADC is called error accumulating structure. Now that we understand the underlying process, some questions may arise. First, we assumed a constant input voltage for our example, which is of course not the normal case. Second, you might ask yourself, how is it that 1-bit conversions, as in this example, achieve the high resolution promised at the beginning with a relatively fast conversion time? To answer these questions, we need to get to know a process called oversampling. To understand it, we will look at the delta sigma process from a different perspective. Here we can see that an input signal limited to a maximum frequency fmax is converted by a modulator into a bitstream, as we have already discussed. The modulator is clocked with a multiple of the minimum Nyquist frequency. 2 times fmax. It generates an output bitstream of the rate fbit is OSR times 2 times fmax, where OSR is the so-called oversampling ratio. The bitstream is then filtered by a digital low-pass filter. By the way, a delta sigma digital to analog converter 
would work similarly. A modulator first oversamples the digital input signal, which originally has a sampling rate of about 2 times f max. The intermediate bitstream is followed by an analog low pass filter to obtain the output signal. In both cases, the bandwidth of the filter limits the incoming bitstream. Let's go over the modulator again. Its output is a fast oversampled stream of ones and zeros. If you consider these bits as plus minus one volts, the modulator produces a stream whose mean value matches the input signal. The modulator simply strives to minimize the average error between the input signal and the DA converted output stream. One could say that the oversampling process achieves a higher resolution not by reducing the error between the analog input and the digital output, but by making the error more often. For a practical example, we consider the oversampling ratio OSR to be 64, which means that for an audio signal with a typical Nyquist frequency of Fs is 48 kHz, the output sampling rate F bit of the modulator would be around 3 mega samples per second. Now we filter the output of the modulator with a digital filter at the end of our signal chain. Naively, we achieve a higher resolution by averaging many 1 bit samples. So let's filter the bitstream by simply taking a running average that captures 64 consecutive bits at once. What does the output look like? Well, if we take the average value of 64 bits, there are only 64 possible values, so we have invented a puny 6-bit ADC. According to this logic, we would have to oversample by 2 to the power of 16 to achieve a 16-bit conversion, which would require a sampling rate of about 3 GHz. In fact, Delta Sigma ADCs are doing much better, so what's really going on? Answering this question in the time domain is a bit tricky, as it needs some knowledge of digital finite response filters. But we will try anyway. The simplified answer is that the digital low pass filter does not simply take a running average of the bitstream. Rather, the individual samples are weighted and summed with carefully selected coefficients. Since they are weighted differently, and each bit contributes to many final output numbers, there are far more than 64 possible results. In addition, a typical FIR low-pass filter weights and adds many more bits over a much longer period than the oversampling rate. This makes it plausible that a much higher resolution could be achieved compared to a simple averaging. This process will be even easier to understand if we make further simplifications and look at the whole process in the frequency domain. Just have a look at this frequency domain model of the modulator. As we saw in our last video, the integrator can be represented as a low-pass filter. In addition, we assume the one-bit conversion process simply adds uniformly distributed quantization noise to the signal output. The output of the modulator can therefore be represented by the following equation. If we rewrite the formula, we can see that when the frequency approaches zero, the noise term goes towards zero and the output of the modulator goes towards the input value x. Conversely, when the frequency is increased, the noise term approaches q and the input signal term approaches zero. In other words, the integrator that serves as a low-pass filter for the input signal acts as a high-pass filter for the quantization noise. If we look at this diagram, we can see that the quantization noise is attenuated at low frequencies. Its spectrum increases linearly up to the oversampling frequency. Since the input signal is only attenuated at high frequencies, 
and the frequency range of interest is at the lower end of the spectrum, the quantization noise is mostly outside of the signal band. This effect is commonly referred to as noise shaping and it is the reason why Delta Sigma ADCs achieve such incredible accuracy. This can be further advanced. To improve the dynamic range of a Delta Sigma ADC, we can not only increase its oversampling ratio, but also build higher order modulators. This example shows a second order modulator. With each additional stage, an integrator is added that further suppresses the quantization noise because each stage increases the order of the high pass filter. This diagram shows the effect of oversampling and higher order modulators on the dynamics of the ADC. The dynamic range and the effective number of bits are displayed as a function of the oversampling ratio and modulator order for a 1-bit oversampling ADC. As you can see, Delta Sigma converters are an extensive topic and there would be much more to discuss. Multi-bit modulators where the ADC and DSC have higher resolutions we have withheld. The problems that occur with higher order modulators would also be worth a whole video. This video is only meant to give you the basics of these powerful ADCs. The interested viewer will find more literature in the video description. I'm Michael with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyway, thanks for watching. For further reference, we highly recommend the following two books. The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, which is very informative as well as entertaining. And for our German-speaking viewers, we recommend Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute. You can find the exact naming in the video description.